like to welcome everyone to the Vasculitis Foundation webinar today. I'm Kathy Olevsky, the host for the Vasculitis Foundation educational webinar, se webinar series, and I'm also a patient living with MPA vasculitis. Today's webinar is about infusions, and our hope is that we answer some questions for everyone, and especially for our patients that are preparing for their first infusion. We are really grateful to have with us several patients today who are gonna share their perspectives on preparing for infusion treatments and just pretty much any advice that they, they would have liked to have had the first time they were gonna get an infusion. Uh, and now I'm gonna let each of us introduce themselves and share a little bit about their background as a patient who had infusions. I think I will start by sending it to you, Mitch, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Okay. My name is Mitch Horowitz, and I was diagnosed with MPA in April of 2021. So this is my three-year anniversary. And uh, prior to that, I had recently retired as a pharmacist who worked in an infusion center. And my job was to prepare the uh, medications to be infused, and also another pair of eyes looking for potential problems and hopefully catching them before they could uh, get to a patient. Thanks, Mitch. We're, so we're introducing ourselves and we're gonna get to the important questions in just a minute and share. So let's see, Art, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Art Diaz and I was initially diagnosed with uh, vasculitis back in 2017 and specifically diagnosed with uh, GPA. And uh, I think this is a great forum to to talk about because when I had my infusions, I was you know completely left in the dark and really didn't know what to expect. And certainly uh, would have loved to have you know someone to to reach out to and, and answer some of some of my questions. That is so true. And Sandy, you want to introduce yourself? My name is Sandy Nye. I also have MPA, microscopic polyangiitis. I was diagnosed with vasculitis in 2014. But prior to that, I was diagnosed with undifferentiated connective tissue disorder. So I have taken infusions continually for 15 years. Wow. And I am Kathy Olevsky. And as I said, I am a patient living with MPA vasculitis. And I was diagnosed in 2008. And I have a variety of medications that were tried on me way back in the day. So uh, with that, I think I'm going to start by asking you all, Maybe briefly summarize your infusion experience and how long you've been receiving infusions and what types of infusions. And I think I'll save my part for the end again. And I'll, how about Art, how, how about if I let you go first? Yeah, so when I uh, was first diagnosed with the um, uh, vasculitis, I was you know introduced to all kinds of medications. And then finally my doctor introduced me to um, Rituxan. Um, I, didn't know anything about it. Um, so I had a lot of questions. I've never had an infusion before, so didn't know really what to um, anticipate. I was scheduled, I think, originally for four of them um, um, as part of the initial process. And yeah, I, I was scared because I had no anticipation of what was going to go on. Um, but basically, but I would could, could tell to um, a lot of uh, new patients that haven't had this before, and it might be a little different for 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 each patient. But um, I was in the office that first time for about six hours. They have to go a little slower that first time for me just to see how you reacted to to the medication. Um, I know I can't remember which one they gave me first. They gave me the Benadryl, and then I think the steroid, and they had to wait there. I think another twenty thirty minutes, and then eventually. Um, give me the the rituxan and it uh was a slow you know process that first time but i at least for me i was able to tolerate it okay um and then every 30 minutes i had the nurse come check my um you know blood pressure make sure everything was okay um it's very helpful that you bring whatever you want uh need to to make you comfortable a blanket laptop book um just to make the process as comfortable as as you can because you will be there um, for some time, um, I know it's, it was kind of hard for me to kind of nap or sleep because again, for me, the nurse was checking up on me every, every 30 minutes, just to check my heartbeat and make sure, um, everything was okay. Um, then when I came back from the second one, they were able to speed up the drip a little bit more. Uh, I was still about, you know, a three, four hour, um, 
process, but uh, at least for me, you know, after that first first round, when I kind of knew what it was going to be like for the other sessions, it, it made me feel comfortable. But yeah, initially I was scary because I like I didn't, you know, anticipate what was going to happen. You know, they told me you're going to be here a good five, six hours. So so plan plan accordingly. Um, but after that, it, it it was a much smoother process. So I think having something like this to to address the questions or what to expect is, is great for for new patients that that's never had infusions before. That's great, Art. I think we're going to get into dive into the details of that, that a little bit more. Um, so, but first, I would like to let uh, let's see, Mitch. Why don't you tell us about you have a very special background to talk about infusions anyway? But tell us what kind of infusions you had and any basic information you have. Okay, when I was first diagnosed, I was in the emergency room, and then they admitted me. And they were waiting on some def, you know, definitive lab work, but they started to treat me because it seemed pretty obvious. So the first uh, three days I was in the hospital, it was very simple. I just got uh, steroid infusions, big dose, like the equivalent of a thousand milligrams of prednisone. And that's really just run over, say, half an hour. There's no need to get, receive any pre-meds for that. And then the next day, uh, my rheumatologist had decided to do cyclophosphamide, which is actually an old cytotoxic chemotherapy agent. And they're not using that for killing any cells specifically, or not cancer cells, but a side effect of that is to suppress your immune system, which is what we want. That infusion, you get pre meds, you get some uh, steroid. Uh, and also something to prevent nausea. And then you get the cyclophosphamide, and that uh, didn't take very long. I, uh, I'd say that was a one-hour infusion. Where I used to work, we would do it in 30 minutes. And I experienced no particular side effects from that. And uh, that was done in lieu of rituxin because my rheumatologist thought rituxin was a a grand slam immunosuppressor, and this was in the middle of the COVID, mm -hmm. you know, uh, pandemic. So she thought uh, cyclophosphamide would be effective, yet not let, render me so susceptible as to almost guarantee getting some infectious uh, agent in me. But uh, again, uh, my knowledge of all of this really led me to not be afraid because I knew exactly what was going to go on. I knew what I, all the meds I would get. And I also knew that the dose of cyclophosphamide was a small one. And although there's not much hair up here to begin with, but I wouldn't lose any hair from that anyhow. And uh, also my uh, labs would not drop, my blood counts would not drop dangerously low Whereas when you're receiving cyclophosphamide for chemotherapy, it's like three or four times that dose and, and there's a much bigger risk. Mm -hmm. So I finished uh, six courses of that, sometimes in the hospital, sometimes in an infusion center, but the medication was always the same. And my uh, rheumatologist declared remission and now it was this time for maintenance rituxin which is not as aggressive initially as uh, using rituxin first. So again, it's a little bit lower dose, not quite as frequent. And also I knew exactly what to expect with the pre-meds, what the possible reactions to the medication could be. And uh, fortunately I tolerated it very well. I was very relaxed and uh, I really suffered no uh, toxic effects from the drugs. So my experience was was favorable. Okay, well, thank you so much, Mitch. I knew your perspective would be different as somebody who knew exactly what these things meant. And the, the rest of us going in are 100% are don't, most of us don't know that information. And Sandy, you want to tell us about your uh, early experience and what uh, infusions you had? Sure. When I first started, I had two 1,000 milligram prednisone infusions. And that made me crazy hyper. 
And after that, I thought, are all infusions going to do this? Am I going to have the shakes? Am I going to be um, hyper? But I've learned that that's not the case. Um, after the prednisone, I had methotrexate infusions. After that, I had cyclophosphamide infusions. And for the past 10 years, at least twice a year, I've had a rituximab infusion. And for the past four years, at least 13 times a year, I receive IVIG infusions. And those are protein immunoglobulins um, that are made from the plasma of thousands of people. And I'm taking those because I've been on rituximab so long that my immune um, immunoglobulins have dropped. And so I need the IVIG to boost those up while I continue with the rituximab. But when I was first introduced to infusions, I was terrified, like many people watching this infusion were. But now I honestly consider it an infusion spa day because I know what to expect. I take my uh, book or some snacks. They give me a heated blanket. They give me a heated recliner to lay back on. They set the infusion up and I just relax for the next few hours. What a great perspective. <laughs> infusion spa day. Maybe yeah. we can make that a hashtag and, <laughs> and everybody get excited about it. Um, so as for me, I actually had to look things up today before we all met because I, uh, it was so long ago when I was diagnosed, I also was in the hospital. Um, well, I received a diagnosis and had to go in the hospital immediately. Uh, I was, my kidney function was, uh, pretty, pretty low. So my first experience, I don't think I was nervous because I was in the hospital with a magnificent doctor who knew everything about my disease. And uh, I had, I, I think my first infusion was cyclophosphamide, which is also called cytoxin. Uh, it was started out with, um, I had a thousand milligrams of um, steroids. And I also in that time period did plasmapheresis. So it was like all happening at the same time. Uh, so my memory is a little fuzzy because that's 2008 and that was quite some time ago. I also had a couple of other uh, IV infusions. I had um, azathioprine, which is Imuran. And unfortunately I had a life-threatening allergic reaction to that one. It doesn't mean everybody would. And also it's not a uh, standard of care for um, most vasculitis patients at this time. And I had mycophenolate, which is also known as Celsept, which I think most people take orally now, but I did have that, I believe, as an IV way back when. And then finally, uh, that was those three or four were over a period of six years or four years. And then rituximab was becoming a thought at that time. And so I got rituximab and I was in remission within a year with rituximab. Um, it was four or five years trying all the other things and not achieving remission. So um, the rituximab, I consider my lifesaver. And uh, every single one of these I did as an inpatient, including the rituximab, because I had proven myself to be somebody who could have allergic reactions. And some of them were very bad. So the rituximab was so new and um, my doctor just wasn't sure how I was going to handle it. And so I was admitted and it was dripped very slowly. I did have an initial reaction that some people have, just like some tingling of my lips. And they then gave me Benadryl. I think they give Benadryl as a pre-med now, if I'm not crazy. You all can clear me up on that, but they didn't do it back then. And then they stopped it for a little while and then they started it again and they ran mine overnight. <laughs> it was it was a very slow, very long drip and I had absolutely no problem with it after that and just slept. So I, I think my experience was a little bit different. Um, but I think what I'm gonna do at this point is go back to Mitch because Mitch as a pharmacist and somebody who worked in an infusion center, I'd like to know your thoughts a little bit on uh, for people who are patients now that are facing this and just 
you know, exactly how, what should they expect from your perspective? So give them a little bit of educated and patient perspective. Okay. The, uh, when you arrive, you will certainly will be greeted by someone who will take you to the, to where your uh, chair or your little cubicle will be. And probably shortly after that, a medical uh, assistant, uh, uh, someone who is not the nurse yet, will come and take your vital signs, blood pressure, temperature. They may listen to your heart uh, and they'll just uh, tell you, they should tell you what they heard. And uh, you'll sit for a few more minutes, probably the nurse will come by. And uh, this is an opportunity for you to discuss with the nurse and be clear about what you are going to get with it. I would ask the names of the medications and what they're for. And hopefully it would uh, jive with what I'm expecting. So at that point, someone's, if it's your first time, someone should take your medical history and feel free to tell them the total truth. No one's keeping uh, a permanent record to rat on you to your spouse or anything. If, if there's any embarrassing issues there. And then uh, the nurse will start your IV and you'll get whatever pre-meds, usually an antihistamine. Uh, if it's something like cyclophosphamide, you get something for nausea and a, a small dose of a steroid. My doctor doesn't use Benadryl. She uses Zyrtec uh, tablets. So that's one less thing to wait for it to infuse. And uh, then they'll bring the, uh, uh, it, you know, re retouching is what I'm currently getting, but whatever it is. And I would also recommend, don't be afraid. You want to see the label on the bag. You want to see your name on that. You want to see the name of the medication and the number of milligrams or whatever that you're expecting. And if it's not what you're expecting, feel free to ask why. And never be um, ashamed to ask a question, just ask it, you know, I mean, they're really legally, if nothing else, uh, responsible for answering all your questions. And then however long the infusion takes and periodically someone will come by and do your vital signs and ask you if, how you feel, if everything's okay. And if you're uh, feeling well, say, yes, I'm fine. If you have anything like the tingling around the lips, you're starting to get a little itchy on your arms or your the trunk of your body, call them over. Don't wait for them to come. That could be a sign of a reaction. So it's imperative. This is your responsibility to let them know if you don't feel right. But let's assume everything goes well. Your infusion's over. They'll take the IV out. They'll do one more vital signs. And then probably they'll just say, okay, see you next week or next month or whatever. And it should, the only thing is difference is it takes different amount of time for each medication that you're there for, reduction, cyclophosphamide, et cetera. And, okay. and unless you're sleepy from the Benadryl, you should be able to go home yourself. But it's nice to have someone pick you up. Okay, great. Thank you so much for the pointers there. I think what we'll do now is talk to each one of you about your experience, like how do you prepare? Are there any tips that you have for anybody for what you do different, like sort of like what Sandy told us about it being her spa day. So I'll start with art. Do you have some, how do you manage your infusions? Anything special that you do or any tips for people that have helped you? Yeah. So, you, you know, like, Kind of, I like um, Sandy's analogy of spa. You know, it's like you're, you're there to to relax, to make the process as comfortable as you can. So, you know, go whatever clothes you feel comfortable in. You know, um, sweatpants or maybe it's just your your jeans or shorts because you're you will be seated there for a long time. And certainly bring any reading materials. You know, I've seen some people that bring the laptop and, and you know watch a movie. Uh, I my, myself brought some headphones so I can listen to music. I brought some magazines just to, um, you know, kind of read through here and there. And then I brought, you know, some snacks, some treats. So, you know, I brought some like water and I think I brought like candy bars or something because, you know, you, you are there to, to, to be as comfortable 
um, as possible. So um, whatever you feel comfortable with, you know, by all means, bring bring with you. Um, I think they supplied me there with a, a blanket, um, but you're more than welcome to, bring, you know, bring bring your own blanket um, and, you know, feel free to kick off your shoes. And, you know, um, yeah, I think for me, I've had that couch where you can or seat and chair where you can lay out the your feet. So I was just trying to make it as 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 comfortable as possible. Uh, and to Mitch's points, you know, ask questions. You know, at one point I actually needed to go to the restroom and, you know, I, at least at my doctor's office, they didn't have any uh, restrooms for the patients, but they did for the, um, for the workers, but they de definitely allowed me to go use there. So they, they helped me get up and, and use the restroom because, you know, you, you might be there for four or five, six hours. So make sure hey, if I need to use the restroom uh, by all, all means, um, speak up, but really just like almost like being at home what you know when you're at home watching movies something make yourself comfortable um and uh i at least for me i did have somebody drive drive me home but um yeah just whatever you feel you're 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 to make you comfortable at home and no no different there okay great sandy we're gonna go to you next um do you have any particular things that you do on infusion day just for yourself to make sure it's the best experience well, I start the day before, which today's the day before because I have rituximab tomorrow. So I hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. The more I hydrate, the easier it is for me to accept the, my body to accept the infusions. Um, I also don't, I never go on an empty stomach, but I don't go on a full stomach. I eat like a, a gentle breakfast or a gentle lunch just so that I have some substance in there. And as soon as I get to the infusion center, before I sit down in my assigned chair, I use the restroom. Um, I can use the restroom throughout the infusion, but I have traveled an hour and a half. So before I um, get started, I do that. Some of my infusions are weight-based. So when I arrive, after I've used the restroom, the nurses weigh me to decide how fast the drip is going to be. Um, let's see, I have a couple notes for things I don't want to forget. Oh. I'm not sure if it, which if it was Mitch or Art that suggested to talk to a nurse if there's trouble. My infusion nurses have always said, if you feel uncomfortable at all, scream or yell, either help or stop. And when I when they take me into the infusion center each time, they remind me of that. If you have any problems at all, please remember to yell stop or help. And I take that to heart. Um, because I often get restless legs, and I think it's because of Benadryl, I wear comfy slipper socks or take a pair of slippers. My infusion center gives me all the comfies, the pillows, the blankets, et cetera. Um, but I, I do like Art says, I just, I'm comfortable. I don't care what I look like. I'm going to be in that chair for five to six hours with the rituximab, and I just want to be comfortable. Okay. Thank you, Sandy. Anything else? You look like you're going to say one more thing. No? Um, oh, yes. Sometimes the infusion centers offer you snacks. Um, I've had, I've got used six different infusion suites. One of them offered me a menu when I was there for breakfast and a separate menu when I was there for dinner, which I was stunned. Yeah. Others usually have, um, you know, candies or cookies or crackers and apple juice, water, those type of things. If you want to know, reach out to your infusion center before you go. And then you can, so you don't have to carry a suitcase full of things. They often provide many, many things, but the only way to find out is to contact them and ask them. Okay, great. And uh, Mitch, I'll come to you in just a minute, but I, I wanted to throw my um, experience in there. I, I will say that, as I said, most of my experiences were as an inpatient, so they'll be dramatically different than a lot of the people watching this for the first time. But recently, uh, so let me clarify, the last time I had Rituxin was in, I think, 2013. I was in remission for many, many years off treatment until a year ago. So, um, and I've had a few issues since then, but I'm back in remission again. But I did want to say that recently I had uh, eight weeks of weekly iron infusions. So... It's not a vasculitis particular infusion, but we never know as vasculitis patients what additional um, services that we're going to need to take care of ourselves. And apparently my iron level was so low, it was 
not, it was barely noticeable. So I had eight weeks of weekly infusions um, at a great infusion center uh, that was fairly new. They were super nice. There was, um, the chairs were very comfortable, just like you said. I was told to hydrate, hydrate, hydrate beforehand and afterwards. Um, it's a good thing to ask your doctor, are you supposed to eat or not eat beforehand? That's a good question to ask your doctor before you go. Um, also, the reason I was told to hydrate is because, the, now I don't know if this is true for any of you, some people have ports and most uh, vasculitis patients I know do not have a port. So I would get it by IV. And um, I am what is known as a terrible stick. <laughs> so it's very hard to get an IV in my arm. I've just had a lot over the years. And if I hydrate, that does make that a little bit better. So I do drink a lot of water in particular the morning that I'm going. I also ask for the restroom as soon as I get there because of that. And um, I also tell them when they start that my doctor wanted me to let them know that I am a hard stick and they like it. They told me that they appreciate it and they go and get somebody who is the best in the center and that person does my IV. So I, I just in case that that's uh, my piece of advice. <laughs> and then when I, um, while I'm there, I, I was there for about three hours. And most people I think were only there for an hour or two for iron infusions. But again, I'm a little bit complicated. So, <laughs> all right. And now I'm going to turn it over to Mitch because maybe you have some, uh, some thoughts on things that you do personally that make it easier for you that are different from anything we've said. Uh, well, when uh, just a typical day that I'm going for rituxan would be that uh, hydrating, of course, uh, because my veins are pretty good, but I never want to say that out loud at an infusion center because they'll look at me, they'll give me the evil eye like I just jinxed them. Uh, but occasionally, uh, I'm a hard stick. Uh, the other thing is I uh, bring snacks with me because my infusion center really doesn't have anything. I don't know why, but they, they don't. So I bring snacks. Sometimes if I'm going to be infused and it's going to run around lunchtime, I'll bring a sandwich with me. I just time my eating regularly. And if I, I'm going for the infusion after lunch, then I'll eat lunch first. But uh, like Sandy, I won't, I'm not going to have a, you know, half a pizza or anything like that. I'll, I'll just make sure that it's nice and light and bring some uh, snacks in case I get hungry. And I also bring uh, headphones like Art does to listen to music, uh, and uh, I make sure that I know what, what meds I'm getting, and it's routine now, so I don't have to do any research. If you're a first-timer, I suggest that you find on the web, the drug company will probably have a page with patient-oriented information mm. and frequently asked questions. It's a good idea to have read that first before you get to the infusion suite so that you kind of know what to expect and uh, try to be calm. It's very, I know it's very frightening, but if you're calm, your blood vessels will be easier to stick. That's one thing. Uh, and if you do have a reaction, the reaction will be somewhat less, uh, not, not saying that you won't need to be treated for the reaction, but uh, you'll stay calmer if you, if you just keep focused on the fact that everybody here knows what they're doing and have seen the reaction you're having many times before and they know what to do. So, but uh, I'm very fortunate I haven't had any reactions. And to me, I'll, I'll also agree that this is a little me time because I'll listen to the music, I'll watch TV and I try to stay really as relaxed and um, zoned out. So, you know, uh, just looking for that little karmatic experience of being uh, in a meditative state. Okay. And that well, helps me get through. That's awesome. Great. Uh, Sandy, go ahead. Um, I want to follow up on, on what you and Mitch both said. 
My infusion has a machine, and Mitch may know the official name, but we call it a vein finder. So yeah. for those who are hard sticks, yeah. they use a vein finder, and it makes it a lot easier. And if it's the same thing I'm thinking of, my vein finder was a little box-like unit that they put over my arm, and it it like lit up in colors where right. my veins were. So it's not, they don't stick you with anything to find right. your vein. They, they light it up, and, it, and, uh, and they put heat on my arm sometimes to help plump my veins, I guess, is what they said. So mm -hmm. a lot of, they know what they're doing. That's all great. Okay, I'm going to go to you, Art, and ask you after your infusion, is there anything that you do that day or the next day? Because that is a very common question from first-time patients. Some of them have been told they can go back to work, but they don't believe that. They don't know what to do. So what's your thoughts on that, Art? Yeah, I think I think maybe since it's going to be your first round, everybody's going to react a little bit different. So I I would suggest at least on that first time, you know, maybe take that day off of work. I I found myself to be you know functional the the next day, um, where I I was able to return to work. But as a precaution, that very first time, I I, I took the next day off because I I didn't know, you know, how it's going to uh, feel. I know some people feel feel very tired and they want to just basically sleep for that balance of the day or their next day. So I think maybe as a precautionary that first time, perhaps take that that next day off. Um, I didn't I didn't have uh, uh, really like a breakfast, but I did bring snacks. Um, but I tell you what, once I got out, I, I I was ready to go go eat. So I on my way home, I you know got something to eat, and then again continued to um, hydrate for the, the the balance of the day. And then the next day, you know, I was actually quite shocked that I I felt good, I felt fine, but I have heard. Um, some people tell me where they just feel tired for, for that day or the, or the next day, or they got, you know, ran over by a truck. So I would definitely um, recommend to um, um, take the next day off. I know for my, my um, doctor, she only did, um, does them one day a week, Thursdays, but um, if you can, maybe Friday is a great day. So you've got, you know, now Saturday and Sunday, off um but i would definitely at least that first go around you know take that next day off because you're, you're not sure how you're going to react and again everybody is going to react differently mm -hmm. how about you sandy how do you handle the after your infusion well i cannot drive myself home um I, the benadryl knocks me out for a long period of time so i have to have someone drive me home so but for my ivig infusions which are every eight, 28 days I have an infusion buddy. We found each other online on a Facebook group for vasculitis. We live 15 miles away and she does not even take Benadryl. She doesn't need it. So she drives us down, drives us home. And to celebrate after our spa day has come to an end, we stop at a Starbucks or a tea store or a Bundt cake or a cookie place. And we celebrate we're going to live a little bit longer because that medicine is going to help us. And we have a celebration with some fun snack on the way home. I love that. <laughs> so Mitch, how do you handle afterwards? What kind of activities do you do or not do after your infusion? Uh, usually I'll take the rest of the day and just relax. Uh, as, as a retired person, that's not hard to arrange. <laughs> uh, but I, uh, I don't worry about the, the day after, the day after whatever I might have on my schedule, I'll leave, you know, active. And uh, I don't, I tend not to be um, affected, like I'm not tired or anything. I know a lot of people do get fatigued, but that hasn't been my problem. Okay, great. All right. Now what we're going to do is go to some questions that have been submitted by patients and let you all answer uh, questions from to get exactly to the root of what they're thinking. So the first one is, I have to find out where I was. Oh yeah, I'm scheduled for my first infusion next month. I'm very nervous that I will react to the treatment. I would like to be reassured that nurses or infusion attendants will be prepared for an issue. You know, Mitch, I think you touched on that, but I think you can give us the most confidence because of your experience. You wanna answer that one? Yeah, especially with rituxin, and I don't. Per, I have no personal experience with other, um, you know, biologicals. Uh, but with rituxin, there is a significant chance that you'll have some kind of reaction. But it could be very minor. You might just get a little itchy, 
course, most people have no reaction. I really like to make that clear. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you do have a reaction, and and we, we went over this, that you should really push that call button if you feel anything uncomfortable. And, and they will know what to do to address it. It's not a life-threatening allergy, but it feels like it. So, yeah, you're going to be uh, scared, but take some uh, consolation in the fact that the staff there has done this many times and has reacted to people who are having a reaction. They know the drill. They stop the infusion. They administer probably some more steroids, maybe some more antihistamine. And things will calm down. And that's why I say if you can stay calm, and I know not everybody can, that's a maybe just an inborn skill someone might have. Uh, it will pass. It's very likely to pass. And don't be afraid because they're going to restart it. But they're going to start it again slowly because probably the reaction was from the rate of infusion and not because you're allergic to it. And that's why some people end up going to stay overnight in a hospital because uh, they just have to get it so slowly that it's going to take longer than the infusion center is open for. And we had a patient uh, that uh, when, where I last worked, some doctor found this uh, um, protocol where they got it really like very dilute solution for a couple of hours. I ended up having to make like five bags of Rituxan at different concentrations. They were infused at different rates for a couple of hours, then taken down. The next bag went up, which had more Rituxan in it, and that was given a little faster. And this went on over 24 hours, and that patient would have had a bad reaction uh, the first time, had no reaction. But it is inconvenient to have to go to the hospital for 24 hours like that. But if you need the medication, I, I would say that's, that's worth it. But they also predicted that doing this two or three times uh, would uh, prevent reactions in the future. Mm -hmm. Now, this patient didn't have vasculitis. They had lymphoma, so they were going to get every month for, you know, maybe six to eight months, they were going to get this drug. So they need, you know, they needed it as, as life-saving with no other alternative. So even if you have a reaction, there are still ways to administer the drug safely. Okay, great. Um, I just will ask if Art or Sandy, if you have anything to add to that. I just felt like Mitch would be maybe a great resource in answering that. Do you have anything to add to that, what he said about reactions? When I first started rituximab, my first two infusions, I had small reactions. And so I prefer to have a slower drip. So my drip will continually be at five hours instead of three or four, like some people get to, just because the, the reaction didn't kill me, would never kill me, but it makes me unsettled. So we just know that I'm going to be a slower drip. And how about you, Art? Anything to add? Yeah, I, I guess the, the one big takeaway is just that everybody's going to react different. I know for me, the Benadryl, I, I didn't like, you know, those initial moments, it just, you know, kind of made me feel weird. Once, you know, I got settled in, I, I was okay. Uh, but outside of that, I, I didn't really have any um, side effects, you know, that day of or the next day. But really, I think the big key takeaway is everybody's going to re, you know, react different. Um, but knowing that, you know, you have a nurse there that's going to be attending, you know, like in my case, she was she was popping in every 30 minutes to, you know, check your heart, check your blood pressure. So it's not like, hey, we're going to administer this and we'll come back and see you in six hours no they're there to check and then again to mitch's point just make sure hey uh, you know hit that call button or or, or uh, speak up i know i did that one time when i like i need to go to the bathroom I'm like i'm still going to be here for another three or four hours um and you know they 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 um took care of me accordingly so again yeah, don't don't be afraid to to speak up and it's um great to have questions you know ahead of time um, and write them down because there's so many things you're going to pop in your head and then you forget and then you remember later. So I would say whatever questions you do have to, to address, write them down on the paper so, so that you don't forget. Right. Good advice. You know, um, another portion of that question, Mitch, I'll just come back to you for a minute is somebody asked, can you 
do you have to worry about reactions after you leave the infusion center, like the next day or later that day? You know, I, in my experience, I haven't heard of anybody um, having a reaction after they finish you know, the infusion. Everybody I've seen had the reaction during the infusion, but that doesn't mean it's completely impossible. So you're, as a patient, you're aware of how you normally feel mm -hmm. and just try to stay cognizant of that for like the next 24 hours. And uh, don't be afraid to call or, you know, call the doctor's office. Someone's on call 24 or seven, even if it's not your doctor to advise you. And, uh, and if, if for some reason you can't get in touch with them and you you feel that this could be life-threatening, there's always 911. But uh, I, I'm not aware of anybody who called 911 the next day for from uh, Rituxan. Okay, and um, I, I, I don't know. I think we sort of touched on what all of us had. Um, maybe we'll just like quickly review that. What kinds of infusions do vasculitis patients get is one of the questions. So the ones that I had that I spoke about are no longer used, most of them, for vasculitis. There's a standard of care um, for most vasculitis patients, and you can find that on the Vasculitis Foundation website, but there... Um, maybe just review what infusions you all have had so that people know what are some of the things that we've experienced. And, and my additional one of iron infusions, it does have something to do with my vasculitis, but they don't know exactly what. So that's not a standard order for vasculitis patients. Uh, Art, you want to tell us what you've had? Yeah. So uh, I, I did have the rituxan initially, but I did have, um, um, some battles with anemia and, you know, we were in, uh, increasing my iron pills at home, but it wasn't working. And then just getting tired and then finding my hematologist uh, su uh, suggested to do some infusions. And I did, uh, I think I did about two or three of those sessions, you know, there were like uh, four each time. So then they were like a week apart. Um, so I've had that as well. Um, that one is, at least for me, was a lot quicker sessions, quicker sessions, those were like maybe 20, 30 minutes. And again, I, I did like uh, one a week for like four weeks. And I believe I did like three sets, sets of those. And same thing, my doctors couldn't figure it out, but they, they said it was probably related, related to, to my um, vasculitis. Okay. And uh, Sandy, you, you sort of told us what you had, but review that real quickly for us. I currently take rituximab approximately every six months. I get IVIG infusions every 28 days, and that's because of the long-term prednisone or the long-term rituximab. And I also take reclast for my bone health due to all of the prednisone that I've taken over the years. Okay, and Mitch, you want to review what you, you have for your vasculitis? Yeah, initially the uh, steroid loading uh, and then the cyclophosphamide, and then at the um, completion of six cyclophosphamide infusions, we took a little break in general, and then my rheumatologist put me on rituxan right on the maintenance dose. So unlike most people who were getting it for the first time, I didn't have that large dose, and then a, a second large dose two weeks later, followed by um, once every six months. I just started at once every six months. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. And I am going to move on to another question, which is what are some reasons a planned infusion might be canceled? Illness, the day of the infusion. I think that's like a loaded question. Like how many things should you do? Should you be concerned about if you need to cancel? I, I can tell you personally, I did have to cancel one of my iron infusions because I was just so sick. I just, I didn't think it would be good for me to go there. I didn't feel like I could get myself there. I just, I felt awful. It was my last one. And um, I also had um, an infusion canceled because my insurance had not cleared it yet. So uh, anybody else want to address that? Art, you have anything to say? I, I have not had any counsel, but um, the one, the second one you mentioned, I've heard, unfortunately, a lot of patients that, that have had to counsel because of insurance reasons, you know, there's a lot of 
red tape, a lot of paperwork going, and then the insurance denies it, and then the doctor has to reach out to the insurance and um, to to recommend this, you know, treatment. And then, you know, there's a there's a time process there. And I've heard many patients that, yeah, I've, I've had to cancel it because my insurance didn't approve it or um, it wasn't approved by the, the time of my um, scheduled appointment. Um, so that's the most common one, common one that I've heard through through other patients. Sandy? If you are extremely nauseous or vomiting, you will not be able to get your infusions from my experience. And my physicians have always told me if my temperature is above 100.4, I'm not to get an infusion. Hmm. So. And how about you, Mitch? Well, I had a few extreme situations when I was first diagnosed. So shortly after, I think the second cyclophosphamide, I had a blood clot in my left leg. Mm. And also called a DVT. So I ended up hospitalized for that. And uh, in the middle of getting treated for that, I ended up with a perforation in my colon. So I had emergency surgery. So until all of that settled down, which took about six to eight weeks, any future you know, cyclophosphamide infusions were on hold. But that's pretty extreme. Nothing that you would experience at home. Just proves that anything can happen. And moving to a fairly easy question, but I'll just ask all of you if you've ever, ever account, encountered any issue with this. Somebody asked, can my husband come with me? And the infusion center I went to welcomed people with you. They had as much conversation with my friend and my husband and everybody else that was with me as they did with me. So uh, Sandy, if you said you've had people with you that were getting infusions. Said you take guests also? I took guests. My husband went with me for the first few infusions, but I did encounter one of my six infusion centers that did not accept other people because of the privacy of the other patients getting infusions. But five out of the six accept a spouse, a partner, a caregiver, your driver. Okay. And how, how about you, Mitch? Well, uh, some of my infusions took place during the worst of the pandemic, so nobody was allowed but the patient. Uh, and since then, they've kind of lightened up, but since now, it's only once every six months, and I, I'm fine on my own. Last time, I drove myself. Mm -hmm. uh, my, you know, I always say to my wife, do you want to come? And if you do, great. If you don't, that's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll be okay. And the past uh, two times, I guess she's feeling a little confident in my, you know, my situation. Whereas at first it was like, she really wanted to be with me to make sure I was okay. Uh, but now it's, it's like not a question of whether I'll be okay or not. And now the infusion only takes about three hours as opposed to five or six. So I can, I can handle it totally on my own. So I, if, if she doesn't feel like going on, she has something she has to do, that's fine with me. Okay. Well, that's good advice. And Art, did you ever encounter any problems with bringing people with you or did you bring somebody with you to any of them? No, in my case, I was allowed to bring somebody. So I brought my wife um, and, you know, she would sit there next to me. Sometimes she'd take a break on the lobby or, you know, go drive off to the local Starbucks, come back and bring me a drink. So, mm -hmm. but I was fortunate enough that I can can have somebody there and you know um you know she would take breaks for herself um, um but go in and out but no i was fortunate that, that they did allow someone to go back back with me okay and i just want to say one more time everybody is going to have a different experience with uh infusions and you know Anybody that's watching this recording, you shouldn't actually make decisions based on what you've seen here today. Always talk to your doctor about it to get the exact correct information. We're just patients and we're sharing our experiences with you. And um, I would like to say thank you to all of each of you, Mitch, Art, Sandy, for sharing your experiences with other patients. Um, we know how scared we were originally, and I'm sure it does help. Sandy, did you want to add something there? Um, two quick questions or two quick comments. I would really, really want people to know that it doesn't matter how scared you are or how traumatic you think this is going to be. These infusions can A, save your life, 
and B, save your kidneys and other organs. So keep that in the back of your mind. Don't be so fearful that you won't go because these infusions are going to be extremely beneficial to you. That is that is so important to convey. And since you had a good message to convey, Mitch, do you have anything you'd like to say, a final tip for patients that are watching that maybe are facing their very uh, first infusion? Well, you know, just to comment on something you said about what we are just telling our experiences. Uh, if you're talking to your doctor and say something we've said and you want to relay that to the doctor, as somebody who talked to a lot of doctors while I was working, I would propose what I thought maybe is different than what the doctor suggested. But I would always say, what do you think about that? Try to keep any conversation with your doctor, whether it's about infusions or anything, uh, leaving you know the option that you understand if they don't agree with you. Uh, if it's something you feel really, really strongly about, then press back a little bit. But uh, I always found that by not telling the doctor what to do, mm -hmm. but asking them if they what they think about what I want to do, mm -hmm. uh, usually it gets a better response. So that's just a little advice to any patient, actually. Well, that is very good advice. And Art, any final tips? Yeah, just the big key, uh, big key that you mentioned is that everybody's going to react different, but on um, having this type of forum, especially for someone that's uh, going in for the very first time you know, kind of get a scenario of, of, of what to expect. Cause I know for me, I, I was in that situation where I was scared. I, I had no idea about, you know, the Benadryl, um, really what, what this whole experience was, was going to be like. And in the end, you know, um, at least on that first session, I felt a lot better. So when I came back from that second time, I, I you know, I felt more comfortable and I, I wish I would have been able to talk to somebody that had been through that process just, you know, so they can kind of walk me through it, but also keep in mind, you know, it's, it's going to be different for, for, for everybody. Another, another great point. That's why we're doing this recorded webinar because we've had so many comments from patients facing it for the first time. You do feel better the second time because you're, is no more of the fear of the unknown. Um, well, thank you again to Mitch, Sandy, and Art for spending your time with us today to talk about such an important topic. And of course, thanks to the Vasculitis Foundation for supporting our the Vasculitis Foundation Medical Webinar Series and to our sponsors, Amgen, AstraZeneca, and Novartis for making it possible for us to continue to record these webinars. And now I think I would like to share um, a page from the Vasculitis Foundation website um, just because it's great information and I'm not sure everybody knows about it. And I just wanted to make sure that they knew it was there. Um, there's a treatment page on the Vasculitis Foundation website. And if you scroll down, there's a video recommended for you to watch about first getting started. There are um, beginning treatment, including preparing for an infusion. If you hit the drop down, there's all kinds of information. A lot of what we said today but some basic information for you. Um, FDA approved treatments for vasculitis and some that have been used in the past. There's just all kinds of information here that might be helpful. So I just wanted to point that out before we left today. So again, thank you to everybody for being part of this webinar today.